This is Ambition Today. Today we are joined by Brian McCullough. He is the host of the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast, and he's also the author of How the Internet Happened. This is Ambition Today. These are the entrepreneurs, creators, investors, and builders who ambitiously change to the world. Explore the hardships and heroisms of everyday life while we reveal the key moments to leave behind a lasting legacy. This is Ambition Today with Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? I am Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to Ambition Today. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite app. Check it out in Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. We now have the Ambition Today back channel. After every episode, we ask each guest for the single greatest piece of advice they've ever received in their lifetime and for them to tell us the story of how they learned it. If you want to find out Brian's single greatest piece of advice, check out siskar.co slash A-list to join for as little as $3. In case you missed it, last episode was episode 50. We were interviewed Ramphis Castro, who we brought back from episode one. He's the managing director at ScienceVest. But today, I'm really excited. We are joined by Brian McCullough. He is the host of the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast. Tech Meme is one of my favorite go-to news sources uh, on the internet and really in tech for general. And he's also the author of How the Internet Happened. Brian, welcome to Ambition Today. Uh, Thank you, Kevin. Happy to talk to you. Thank you. I'm really excited to have you here. We're here at your office uh, in Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. So, how's it going? Good. Believe me, uh, it doesn't sound like it, but this is the best acoustic uh, conference room that exists here because I've tried them all for podcasting purposes. So. You're good. You're good. And, and you know, uh, Justin, uh, our editor, does amazing work. All I'm right. Sure, uh, uh, you know, Justin will will fix this up. But it's it's great. Welcome uh, to the podcast. So. We're here today. We're in Brooklyn. Um, this might be the first episode coming to uh, to the listeners from Brooklyn. So, uh, tell us a little bit about where you grew up and and how you grew up. And were there, was there any entrepreneurial influences um, from that time? Uh, absolutely not. Which is, I think, why I'm passionate about entrepreneurialism. Uh, I grew up in Florida. Not no sort of like you know Dickensian sort of thing. Um, uh, Child of two school teachers, you know, happily middle class, hardworking folk, and that sort of thing. Um, there was no concept. I, I was born in '78. There was no concept in the '80s okay. that entrepreneurialism was a thing. I've said this before in, in other venues where, um, like, if you were ambitious, maybe you wanted to be a rock star or a uh, you know, a, a sports figure, or like if you wanted to get rich, you went to Wall Street. Right. One of the things that, uh, not to plug the book so quickly, but one of the things that I wanted to capture in the book was we live in this world where um, entrepreneurs are rock stars, where we're used to 20 year old kids, 25 year old, whatever, uh, the coding up something and having a billion dollar company. That did not exist in the 80s as a concept. That didn't even exist six, seven years ago. No, it did. Um, no, 100%. It, it did in the, ni- in the to, late to 90s. To the scale it does now. Not yeah, to yeah. the scale it does now, but sure, certainly. It was the Zuckerbergs and, and um, you know, the sister, it, the, the, you know, the, the names that we know um, that, that gave us that. But right, um, when I was coming up, what I, I went to school for film. Because, uh, you know, uh, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction came out. And listen, my entire generation wanted to be Tarantino. And that's what I went to school for. And then I accidentally... um, (laughs) Were you going to get into this? Because I'm already leading into this. Go for it. Um, So as a film major, I was actually on the screenwriting track. Uh, So I graduated in 99, uh, but I have to do a thesis uh, screenplay, essentially. Okay. Uh, so it's 98, summer of 98, and what's happening is the, the dot-com bubble is literally kicking off. And um, so that's what's in the air, and so I decide I'm going to write a, a screenplay about it. it. It's a screenplay that I called Palo Alto. Amazing. But I know nothing about this. I, I get a subscription to Wired. I, like, I go to Barnes & Noble, and I get like industry standard magazines and things like this, and I... And I research all this stuff. I've never been to California, never done any of these things. But I write, I write this, the, the screenplay and everything um, and, and graduate with the degree. 
But then also uh, in one of those Wired magazines, I saw an article about a guy that at Harvard was doing a company where he was editing um, college application essays and like graduate school essays and things like that. And I was like, I could do that because I knew how to do HTML and, you know, whatever. So I just did that same, I just copied it. And um, the the original company was called editmenow.com. But it, that's a seasonal thing. You can't do college, uh, college application essays, you know, a couple times a year. So then it evolved into, well, what's the other thing you can edit is uh, resumes. So then um, I acquired the domain resumewriters.com. And in it's actually in March is going to be 20 years old. Yeah. Uh, March of 1999, resumewriters.com. Wow. Uh, I feel like. The, the play Palo Alto could be your, your Hamilton of uh, 2020. I know that the script exists in a storage locker in Michigan, but I don't know that we'll ever see the live <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, sounds amazing. But, you know, so we're always trying to figure out, and it's really interesting because um, we're always trying to find where those entrepreneurial influences come from. And it sounds like for you, um, really, at the start of the internet, it came from the internet and, and learning about Silicon Valley um, to, when you were doing the, the, the film theater. Thesis. Yeah, I thought I've thought a lot about this lately. Doing the book and and everything I've been doing recently is like how much of it is um, when I was born. It's generational stuff. Like right. I was going on BBSs when I was eleven and twelve. You know, so I was going on the internet uh, in ninety four. I was a sophomore in high school. Like I was there for when the web took off and things like that. So it, it was almost never a question that this type of technology, especially the web, like it just always made sense to me. In the same way that, you know, Zuckerberg comes up, he was born in 84. So like, you know, he he comes up in the world of AIM and, and um, you know, uh, the uh, GeoCities pages and things like that. Yeah. Like, uh, like, my first website was a GeoCities exactly. page. Exactly. His, his was actually specifically Angel Fire, I think. But, but so it's like the – it's almost a generational thing exactly where like my dad, like the music that he listened to, he graduated in 68 or whatever. I think there's a weird thing where like I was the right age for like – even though I didn't go to school for this stuff, even though I didn't want to do it, like it was always like, well, that's clearly the future. And so then when something happened that was like, well, jump into that. It wasn't even a question to me. Yeah. So, like, my entrepreneur, I had no entrepreneurial instinct. It was almost the reverse where I had, I knew the technology almost instinctively. And then I was just like, well, I'll go do that. And then I will learn to be an entrepreneur because of that. You know nice. what I mean? Yeah. So, how, so, how did it go? What, what happened to resume writers? What happens next? It's the only company I still own. Okay. That's what I'm saying. It's 20, 20 years old um, in March. And then, uh, so, uh, 99, the, the dot-com bubble happens. I remember coming here in 99 to do deals with hot jobs and, and other companies that so no longer exist. So, at this point, exist. you're still living in Florida? Uh, no, uh, yeah, I was at the time, okay, right. cool. And then I moved to Michigan because I thought at the time it's an editing thing. I need college students, you know, to work for cheap to do editing. It, we don't have to go into it. Resume Writers is still existing, still doing well, very proud of it, um, has funded every crazy scheme I've done for 20 years. <laughs> um, but then, uh, yeah, I came here in the dot-com era. There was a, there was a resume.com that was a VC-backed, that was my main competitor. And I remember the first time I came here, I went to a bar uh, and uh, it, urinal ads were new <laughs> and resume.com was the urinal ad. I swear to God. Urinal uh, ads were the subway ads of, uh, of the they, day. They're still urinal ads. Well, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, so the dot-com bubble burst. We survived. All of our venture-backed uh, competitors went away. And we made a lot of money for a long time writing resumes for IT people that were out of work. And that's the other thing is that so... Um, we're making money. This has happened several times because of this particular business. When uh, there's recessions or whatever, we're making money when no one else is. <laughs> so the second startup that I did in 2002, as soon as I heard of social media, which forget about uh, Facebook, what MySpace, I'm talking about Friendster. Yeah, we had Jonathan Abrams on the show. I, I've had Jonathan Abrams on the Internet History Podcast. Yeah. Um, as soon as I heard that, I was like, well, that's perfect for jobs. 
for like finding a job and networking and doing that sort of stuff. And so uh, it's 2002. My memory on this is a little blurry. Maybe maybe it's early 2003. All I know is that we started within two or three months around the same time that LinkedIn started. Um, this was uh, Where Are the Jobs? And uh, obviously it didn't become LinkedIn. Um, but um, it, it was early enough that we were able to um, sell some IP from that. And then I took another bite of the apple in 2005. Uh, that was who to talk to. Again, a long, complicated story. And, and that was doing something in social media that no one's ever tried again, but I still think is a good idea. Okay, but anyway, just the idea that in, in the job search space, it's an asymmetrical information market so that um, like you could sit next to someone on a plane and you're an architect and she's an accountant, but your wife is an architect. Or like, so like you could be like, well, my wife's firm is hiring. And like, so like you, all of us know Right. Job openings or potential or connections. So the whole concept was is we were trying to create a market to trade those connections. And we could never quite get it to work. Like, I think we, I think we got, uh, it was over a quarter million. I think it was close to half a million uh, signups and things like that. But we could never get the market to actually do it in the way that it w- that I knew that it would work. And, of course, we could have pivoted to just being a job board or something sounds, like that. Sounds fascinating, though. Yeah, and like I said, uh, if someone wants to take that idea and run with it, you know, just give me a little percentage. But <laughs> uh, I still think the idea would work. Anyway, so that was the third company I started. Nice. So that was who to talk to. That was who to talk to, yeah. Very cool. Um, and then what happened with both of those companies, the second two? Um, so uh, where are the jobs? We sold some, you know, patents and, and other IP and things like that. And uh, 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 who to talk to, we just flat shut down. Okay. Uh, because I am like that. <laughs> so so from, you know, that movie montage part of your life yeah. you know, the, as a CEO founder, what is, um, what would you say is like the number one or maybe top two lessons that you would want to impart on other founders that may be listening? Every, this is kind of why I do what I do now. Uh, everybody, and even on my podcast uh, that, that is successful, comes on and says, um, eventually, if they're old enough and it's enough time, well, of course, I, I knew it. I knew I, I was the genius to see this sort of thing. It's all BS, 100%. And even the concept of pivoting, um, I was talking to someone about this the other day. Um, yes, there are some times when you pivot because you, you tried a thing and you had to, uh, because that thing didn't work and you're just uh, feeling around the dark for anything that'll work. 90% of the time when companies pivot, it's because they tried A, but they got traction with B. And every time that I've done companies and have consulted with companies and invested in companies, th- the pivot is because they thought that their idea was this, but actually your user base or your customers or wherever want to do this. And then you're an idiot if you don't pivot. Yeah. Um, and that's the biggest lesson that I think is... I, I love that lesson. And we see that time and time again with Founder Institute. And sometimes I actually hate... I don't even, What you're talking about, I don't even like the word pivot because mm-hmm. I think that's just building a company. Yeah. I think yeah. that happens majority of the time. No one knows anything. Yeah. That's the problem. And, and you, 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 you create a deck and you pitch it to VCs and you sell them on it or if you're lucky or whatever. But, or you, you, you know, you, you, you do an MVP. Or it, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. Because all you are at the beginning of a company, you're just a group of people with energy. And so your minimum viable product, your business plan – that doesn't mean anything or it shouldn't because you can still be people with energy if you get lucky enough to uh, discover the thing that actually gets traction. Yeah. So how do you, what, what, what advice do you have for founders to be paying attention enough or, or under, you know, collecting feedback in a way that allows them to see that? Um, or if they can't do that, they just shouldn't be founders. Is that the answer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's sort of leading the witness, but yeah, that's the right answer. I mean, Slack Slack being the perfect example. What was Slack supposed to be like? It was a game, right? Right. Well, it well, it was just a tool for them working on the game, 
right? I think it okay. was, yeah. right. It, like, but it was a gaming company, yeah. It was a gaming company, and then this was just a tool for us to manage the development of the game internally or whatever. Um, but so, like, how far away from what they had been putting their blood, sweat, and tears into? Because Stuart had been trying to do a gaming company, I think, for a while. Yeah. Um, but this, it, it, not to, you know, jump in, but it also shows just how important it is to play the long game and, and commit because... It takes time to figure that stuff out. Sometimes you can go too long and, and you mm, really do just You know shut what? Down, but- uh, my personal experience, and this is just me, I'm not uh, telling anyone what to do, but I'm almost saying the opposite. Okay. Um, because you're right in the sense that the long game is that you're, uh, you want to create a company for the long term. You want to create something that's valuable. But what I'm saying is, is uh, be willing to, to kill your babies. For sure. Keep the company alive. Don't, don't, yeah, exactly. Keep your, especially if you have a great team, that's the most important thing. If you have the impulse to, I'm in this space and I think there's something here and I think I'm the person to do it, keep riding that horse. But um, I think actually what kills more startups is like being married to your original vision so much that you can't see those other things, that you can't see, you know what, God, I really want to create this game. I really, no, but by the way, over here you have the the greatest um, workplace productivity app that anyone has ever <laughs> come up with. <laughs> um, so, okay, Stuart, let's do this. No, 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 we're going to do the game. No, that that is probably a better impulse for most entrepreneurs. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So next you go to TED. Uh, how, tell us about that experience. What it's was a, that like? Yeah, well, so what really happened is um, uh, five or six years ago, I decided I wanted to write this book because um, I felt like there's been a lot of books about the history of the Internet and technology, but no one had told the story of how the Internet went mainstream and um, – uh, infiltrated all of our lives. You know, you can go back to the ARPANET and there's academic books about that. It just bothered me that no one had done it. This is my fourth startup because every other startup that I've done has been like, this is a good idea. If I don't do it, someone else will, so why not me? So I was dumb enough to be like, I'll write the history of the internet. <laughs> why not me? Um, being a, a web and startup guy, I'm used to immediate gratification. So the first thing I did is I reach out to people for interviews, I record them. Uh, I got a, a, a large chunk of the original Netscape engineering team, and I'm I'm sitting in that office back there, and I'm like, I'm writing this. It'll come out four or five years from now, and maybe that great hour interview I just got, maybe a sentence of it will make it into the book. So I threw it up as a podcast just on a whim because I was like, you know, whatever. Someone will be interested in this. In the first week, we had 1,000 subscribers. Nice. So that's the Internet History Podcast. We're approaching... 200 episodes now, five years of insane interviews, the guy that invented the MP3 to, um, you know, um, uh, every the, the beginnings of social media. I just did um, uh, one of the founders of the globe.com, which is the quintessential .com era company, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, Chris Fralick of First Round, um, I interviewed him for the show, he said to me, Ted is doing this thing, a Ted residency, you should, you're going to do this. <laughs> so I applied. Um, I was a member of the first uh, Ted residency class. By the way, they do two classes a year. I invite anyone that's doing any, not even in tech, not even in entrepreneur stuff, anything, scientists, artists, whatever, apply to the Ted residency program. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I've known one or two other people that have gone through it and they've, they've said great things. Because you're sitting across from, a, a, you know, a world-renowned marine biologist and um, a Reggie Black, one of the famous graphic artists. And, like, w- w- you spend 12 weeks. So all I did was kept doing what I was doing, um, interviewing people, doing research or whatever, uh, and uh, gave a TED Talk and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, it's fantastic. And that is that was a real force multiplier in the sense that, um, like, it made connections that got me more interviews and whatever. I, 100% the book got sold because of that. Um, so, yeah, I still do work with TED all the time. And what's the name of your talk for anyone that wants to go check it out? Uh, I can't even remember. Look it up because <laughs> I can't remember. It's something about uh, digital history or internet history or something like that. 
Yeah, Google Brian McCullough TED Talk. I'm pretty sure it's the history of the internet. I, uh, I watched it earlier today. Yeah, uh, I don't think that's it. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I can't remember either. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, I still do work with them all the time. And uh, so then the book came out and um, just last October and people seem to like it. That's the thing. Um, knowing nerds like I do, I've been waiting for people to be like, you got this wrong or like, you know, because like I was on the um, – Andreessen Horowitz podcast, and Chris Dixon was like, uh, the reason I like your book is because it rang true to me. And like, so I've been waiting for people to, to be, to, to like pick it apart. Yeah. And because that's how nerds are. Like you get one little thing wrong. And so like, so, far, so, you know, I don't care if it ever becomes a bestseller or anything like that. I'm just thrilled that people think that it's real and true. And I at least got the last 25 years of tech right so far. Yeah, well, I mean, kudos to you. I mean, you know, you, you cover the news every day, uh, five years of podcast episodes and research. Uh, you know, Ted helped you. Like, uh, it's a great book. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, I want to talk about that book and your, new, and your podcast, Tech Me and Ram Home. We're here with Brian McCullough, and we'll be right back with more. This is Ambition Today. Thank you for listening to this episode of Ambition Today. If you want to join the show's back channel, the Ambition Today A-List, you go to siskar.co slash A-List. Ambition Today is also happy to partner with the Founder Institute, the world's premier launch stage startup accelerator. The Founder Institute has graduated over 3,000 technology companies across six continents, and we've learned a lot through doing that. We actually now have over 30,000 data points, and we've post-correlated that with our 3,000 other graduates, and we've basically isolated the personality traits of successful entrepreneurs. These are things like fluid intelligence, openness, conscientiousness, and more. If you want to find out if you have entrepreneurial DNA, go to fi.co slash join slash ambition to apply and take the test and find out today. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to leave us a review, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to your podcast. We really appreciate it. And now back to this episode of Ambition Today. Visit Ambition Today online at siskard.co and follow the show on social media at Ambition Today. Welcome back. We are here with Brian McCullough. We were talking about his journey through entrepreneurship. But next up, Brian, I want to talk about your, your current podcast. It's daily. Uh, are you, you, it's amazing. The Tech Meme Ride Home. Tell us a little about that podcast and, and what you do. Uh, yeah, so because the Internet History Podcast was uh, got popular I, I about a year ago, actually right now, I was talking to uh, various companies about launching tech podcasts for them. And I've been friends with uh, Gabe Rivera, who's uh, the founder of techmeme.com for many years. And uh, I was telling him about it and I was like, you know, all I'm going to do if I ever do one of these is just read Tech Meme every day and then regurgitate. I was like, have you ever <laughs> uh, thought of doing a podcast? He's like, funny that you should mention that. What we thought of is that this is no, not to disparage any other tech podcast, but they're all, or they had been a year ago, you get three idiots around a table and you talk about what happened that week in tech. And we're like, well, we can do that too, but is there anything different? And then what tech meme is good for, if you're not familiar with it, it's been around for 15 years or whatever. Tech meme is like a, a news aggregator. So, you know, people go to it multiple times a day. And if there's, you know, an article about the new iPhone in yeah. the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, yeah, it'll yeah. pull that all into one. It's, it's not, it not only like tells you on an hourly, minute by minute basis, what's new, what's happening, but it's also the context. So like they collect tweets and like, yeah, right. Whatever the big story is today, every venue, the TechCrunch said this, New York Times said that, blah, blah, blah. And, so, and I would argue that most people in tech read tech memes. Right, well, right. And uh, have for years, I know it's been, as long as I can remember, the thing that I check every morning when I wake up. Um, and so what we, what we thought was that the only way to do a podcast for tech meme would be to like do what tech meme does well. So it would have to be timely. Um, obviously, uh, daily is the best we can do right now <laughs> because you can't do hourly or whatever like the, the actual site does. Uh, not yet, at least. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so, right, it's a, it's a 15 to 20 minute um, uh, podcast, but it's not, I think I was talking, again, I was talking to, to a different podcast about this recently. Anyone could do 
a bot that could read the headlines. And so again, what I think what we try to do that TechMeme has done well for 15 years is that it's the context. It's the, you know, so um, the, uh, I, uh, we're recording this, uh, I don't know if it matters, but today the big news was that um, Facebook is probably going to integrate um, all of their messenger back end. So like uh, WhatsApp and Instagram, all uh, Facebook messenger, they're going to pull all the back end together and, and it's going to be one back end product. They're, they're, the independent apps are going to be, but okay, so I can just read that headline to you. But if you listen to today's show, it's a long segment because then I went into a big, long thing of what everyone said about it and like what the implications are. And to me, that that's, that's the thing that's more valuable as opposed to just reading headlines is this is these are the implications. This is what people are thinking about it. And so I've said many times, like, I want it to be if you work in tech, if you care about tech, if you're tech curious, if you go to a dinner party tonight and they ask you about that latest Facebook news, I want you to, like, at least know, sound like you're smart, you yeah. know, like and, and, and know the context of everything. And, and that's called the Tech Meme Ride Home because the podcasts are pretty short, mm-hmm. about 20, 15 to 20, 15 minutes, 20 yeah. minutes. And it comes out every day at 5 p.m. Eastern, so it's the idea. But I, I so you get, can be caught up pretty quickly, is my point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 I get crap all the time from people overseas that are like, "Well, it's my morning, <laughs> it's my write-in show, it's my shower show, whatever." It's the whole point is is that once a day you can get caught up on what's the latest. Yeah, it's pretty great. Everyone can go check that out everywhere podcasts are found. No, all all over the place. Yeah. All the places. Um, and also the website's great. I tell all the founders when they join Founders Suite to bookmark TechMeme. It's a really quick way to plug into the to the ecosystem. Thank you. Um, but very cool. I I also want to talk about your book. Tell us a little bit about how the internet happened um, and, and, and what time frame are you covering here? Yeah, because that's important. Uh, it's not the entire internet from 1969 to 1999. You know, it's the It's just the good parts. Well, uh, so <laughs> I start with the Netscape IPO in 1995 because I argue that that's the big bang of the modern uh, uh tech industry as we know it today. Again, getting back to that idea of this era where entrepreneurs are rock stars, where 20-year-olds can create billion-dollar companies. The Netscape IPO, Mark Andreessen was behind uh, one of the founders of Netscape. Um, that that begins the era, but it also begins the era of um, the internet and technology infiltrating all of our lives into all the little crevices. Again, uh, when I was coming up, I, I got a computer in 1986 and like m- my brother and I used it. My parents didn't use computers. Uh, like as late as when I went to college, like it was still a niche thing to be into tech and to have computing touch your life. Maybe my, my dad did it at work and things like that, uh, but it wasn't all pervasive. It begins with Netscape in 95. Um, so I cover the whole 90s, the dot-com era, Yahoo, eBay, um, AOL, the dot-com bubble bursting, Google coming on the scene, Napster, all that good stuff, Facebook coming on the scene. And then I end with um, the announcement of the iPhone um, because, you know, the, you couldn't explain the modern era if you didn't at least touch mobile and social. So we tell the Facebook founding story and we uh, tell the story of the, the iPhone. Well, it's, it sounds amazing. Um, what are some of like what's your what's your favorite story from from the book? Um, there, well, the the dot com era stuff. There are so many amazing stories about the excess there and the companies that um, were were garbage. But there was a time when it didn't matter if you were garbage because VCs didn't care and Wall Street didn't care and no one cared. Um, but then also, there's so many great ideas that uh, were there in the dot-com era. Grocery delivery. The, one of the biggest blow-ups of the dot-com era was Webvan. Webvan is grocery delivery, is what Instacart is. Um, blew what, what at the time was an insane amount of money, a couple hundred million dollars, and, and blew up in 18 months. Um, but, you know, even little things like uh, the, people remember the Pets.com sock puppet. There were four major uh, Pets-based startups um, or Pets-related startups that, that were in the era and they famously, they couldn't get the economics right. Like they were, they were shipping dog food for less than it cost 
to even ship. And, and these are all problems that we've solved now, like, it, you know, the WAG and, and Amazon, like uh, so many things and so many ideas. There was a, a startup called MySpace at the time. Now, it wasn't MySpace that later became MySpace. It was MySpace.com and it was uh, Dropbox. It was put a f- folder on your desktop and then store your files with us. It was cloud computing, right? And then when that company went under in the dot-com era, um, the company that later became MySpace bought the domain and turned themselves into MySpace. So I just love all the stories of uh, there's always bad ideas For sure. and there's always good ideas. But then there's a ton of good ideas that it's the wrong time for. So one of the, one of the reasons I, I, I'm excited to talk to you is I think because you do the Tech Meme Ride at Home podcast, you, go over, you literally go over everything that went viral in the last 24 hours in, from mm-hmm. a tech news mm-hmm. perspective, right? Mm-hmm. But you've also sort of a historian covered everything over the history. I mean... The, how do those two worlds mesh in your head? The, the micro view and the macro view, and, and you know, I like to. That's why it's a very I, interesting perspective. No, I think it's actually a more valuable perspective. Chris Dixon and I talked about this again on the uh, A16Z podcast because you get anybody. If I got Steve Case on the Internet History podcast, if I got uh, Mark Andreessen on the Internet History, podcast, all those guys go around and talk all over the place, and people want to ask them what's next, what's next, what's next. Now, even the best person in the world, best procrastinator, uh, prognosticator in the world, (laughs) uh, could be right 3% of the time about what's coming next. I actually think that you can get closer to a 5 or 10% uh, prognostication if you look at the mistakes of the past. So I'd want to talk to Mark Andreessen about why didn't, why was Netscape uh, bought by AOL and killed by Microsoft? And, and what happened with Opsware? And like, you know, I've seen interviews with him in the mid 2000s where he seemed pretty pessimistic about tech. And like, so I'm more interested in the lessons learned, even the mistakes. Yeah. Because there's pattern recognition there. Um, so yes, again, you get anybody to come on and tell you about his or her greatest hits and what a genius they were to see how everything worked out. It's more valuable to learn the things that they thought were going to work out, but didn't. And the things that they were sure, uh, and then was a, was a blind alley that I think that and again, my bias is towards history, but I think that if you're an entrepreneur, if you're someone that's trying to see where things are going, especially in tech, but maybe in the whole world, like uh, uh, 50% of what you're reading and what your education has to be about is about the past because there's patterns to recognize, there's lessons to learn, and there, there and, and, and I've been focusing on the mistakes, but then you can also see why did... Facebook beat MySpace. What was what was the thing that they did that didn't work? Like so, like the obsession that tech has with the future. While I understand it, um, I think that it's overdone a lot. Yeah, I mean we're guilty of it as well on this show. We ask about the future a lot, and I'm not going to ask you about you know where you think the future is going. But I would ask you uh, with regard to the venture capital industry, whose job it is to pick that future. What advice would you have for them based on the history of the internet? Is it, is it just that? Is it just brush up, improve your pattern recognition by understanding history? Or are there um, other things I, that you, you know what, I, as well? I'm not qualified to give VCs. Everybody, because, you know, every, every VC has their own um, investment thesis. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, that's, uh, I'm going to give you a perfect example. Learning from the past. Even in this book. One of the things that comes in over and over and over again is that um, for any, especially computing, era of computing, the thing that you do that is always the killer app is allow people to talk to each other. People didn't think computers were communication devices. They thought they were like recording devices. They thought they were brains that were going to replace us or whatever. It turns out computers are the greatest computing gadgets or devices ever created the very first killer app of the internet was email. In the book, when I talk about AOL, 
Why did AOL beat CompuServe, um, uh, Genie? There was a whole bunch of other competitors. AOL, because they allowed people to go on, on chat rooms and talk dirty to each other under um, uh, screen names. So you could go on and, and uh, do sexy talk and, and talk to each other. As soon as mobile comes around, what has been, who, who, are the, who were the huge winners of mobile? It was chat apps, message apps. It was WhatsApp. It was Instagram. It was, so learning from the past, if VR ever wins, right? If VR ever proves out to be the next great platform, I guarantee you the first successful company will be the company that somehow cracks you and me talking to each other in a VR space. Yeah. So like, there you go. There's a learning pattern from the, from the past that I, I almost would guarantee you will play out. I love that. I, I agree. I agree with that completely. Um, well, this has been an amazing episode. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really excited for the book. I, I'm even going to pick it up myself, grab a copy. Anywhere else that people could go and grab it? It's everywhere. Uh, Kindle, all that good stuff. Uh, how the internet happened. Is uh, it going to be a sequel from iPhone to... Uh... Yeah, there's talk about that. We'll see if I can ever <laughs> get the... It took me five years to do this one. But, you know, right. I am doing this every day now, like you said, for the Tech Meme show. So uh, maybe I could just You don't realize it, but you're already doing the research. For already, the exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Anything else you want to plug uh, for the audience? No. Uh, tech Meme Ride Home every single day. I'm on Twitter at BrianMCC, but whatever. Uh, All right. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming on the pod, uh, for taking a listen. The show notes, everything we talked about will be up on our website. Uh, really appreciate it. Brian, thank you for uh, coming on the podcast. Thank you, sir. We're going to take this over to the, to the bonus segment. Or we'll see some of you there. And for everyone else, stay curious. Thanks for listening to Ambition Today. Be sure to visit Siskar.co to get all the information from this episode and more great content. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.